Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Johanna Sullivan. I'm the director of the Office of Public Safety uh, within the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services. Uh, thank, every thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I know, as I can see, the numbers are growing just as we're speaking. We had over 820 people register for this, so I know we're over at about 400, and it's just going to probably keep growing as we go along. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. This is a very complicated topic, and we have a lot to get through. First, I just want to set the stage. This is a very um, high-level presentation. It's intended to provide a high-level overview of extreme risk protection orders and the process in which to gain those. Uh, we're not going to get into granular details, but DCJS will, is working with stakeholders and the MPTC to create a model of policy, which we will be distributed statewide, and that'll address some of more of the granular details. We're thrilled today to be joined by uh, representatives from Every Town for Gun Safety who are here to share all of their knowledge and experience with us about, um, about this topic. So we're thrilled, as I said, to be joined by three colleagues from Every Town. Uh, when we're thrilled, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for Michael Sean Spence, our my former colleague, for joining us today and his leadership on this issue. We're happy to have him here with us, and we're and he's joined by Michael Sean is the senior director uh, for community safety initiatives at Every Town for Gun Safety. We're also joined by Dara Young, who's the associate director. Uh, for community safety initiatives at every town and Sam Levy is the senior counsel. Thank you all these these uh, three individuals have worked really closely with us to help pre prepare this presentation. Our goal is to try to help you all again as I said it's going to be recorded so that you can go back and and touch base with it again and see other resources. So at this time now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Michael Sean. Thank you Johanna. Uh, and once again, it is truly an honor to be with all of you. As was mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Community Safety Initiatives at Every Town for Gun Safety, uh, and I work closely with Dara and Sam. My team has a unique opportunity of leading our organization's efforts uh, to reduce gun violence and improve community safety through direct investment, public awareness, technical assistance, capacity building of community-based organizations, as well as leaders like yourselves. So it's truly an honor to be here with you to talk a little bit more about CPLR 63A, or as we know, red flag laws, uh, and the value that we all know um, they bring. Uh, before joining every town, as was mentioned, I was working at DCJS. Uh, I worked very closely with Dan and Josh, as well as Johanna, Molly Bates, and all the great folks on the DCJS team and the Office of Public Safety, and it was truly an honor to be of service in that role. And I've been able to continue that work here at every town, doing that work across the nation. Before joining DCJS, I was also a prosecutor in the Queens District Attorney's Office. And as was also mentioned, I'm joined by Sam. Uh, Sam is our senior counsel of law and policy at every town. He oversees our state legislative policy in the Northeast region. He works to enact and implement life-saving legislation like the red flag law. Uh, and before joining every town, he was also a prosecutor for almost nine years in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, where he investigated and tried cases in the trial division, as well as in the Office of Public Corruption. Um, and then Dara is our associate director who brings a decade worth of working in direct service of many of the folks that we're hoping to ensure safety for the most vulnerable amongst us, uh, identifying that risk, that high risk behavior that we're going to discuss in a bit and fashioning solutions uh, that are holistic and that can uh, prevent future harm. So it's truly an honor for us to, to sort of get the band back together to do this uh, with all of you. Next slide, please. Uh, I know we have a lot to cover, so we're going to try to get through a couple things, but uh, here are the goalposts for us. Um, obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, red flag laws and the value that they bring, but also how you can identify the extreme risk behavior that might give you the indicia to go and petition for an ERPO. Additionally, the process of filing for one, uh, as well as service, and then how do you terminate or extend an ERPO when it comes to its uh, completion? So we're going to go through these five components over the next hour or so. Uh, Sam and I will go back and forth. Next slide. So as Commissioner Rosado noted, uh, in the wake of the recent mass shooting in Buffalo, the New York State Legislature and Governor Hochul uh, recognized the crucial role ERPOs have in preventing mass shootings, as well as reducing the risk of suicide. As part of a newly passed package of gun safety legislation, uh, as well as an executive order, law enforcement are now required to file for an ERPO where appropriate. 
the impact of ERPO is born out of research, as well as the day-to-day -day experiences of law enforcement agents across the nation who have informed this presentation and have given us consultation over the last few years as ERPOs have been, uh, been taken up more frequently by law enforcement. Next slide. And when we talk about this data that it's born out of, uh, it's reflected in a recent analysis that every town has done that reflected that mass shootings from 2009 to 2020 revealed that 56% of the mass shooting incidents that were examined, and 56% rather, the shooter exhibited warning signs that they had posed a danger to themselves or others before the shooting. That's a critical piece of, of information that many of us are already aware of, and that really points to the fact that there are indicators in advance of shootings that we might be able to identify that will allow us to dispossess an individual of that firearm to prevent the harm of themselves or others. And in New York, we're doing that already. 84% of New York counties have reported at least one ERPO. As was also mentioned, a total of 832 temporary and final ERPOs have been issued in New York in just the last three months, including 184 applications filed by the New York State Police alone. A Herculean effort to be responsive to the urgency of now and evidence that many of you already know the value and are already using ERPOs to ensure the safety of vulnerable individuals and their loved ones. Additionally, in states like Connecticut, which had the first ERPO starting back in 1997, research showed that increased enforcement of their RPO law, as they call it, was associated with a 14% reduction in firearm suicide. One suicide was prevented for every gun removal under that law, and that was an analysis done by Dr. Swanson at Duke University. In Indiana, one of another early adopting states, a 7.5% reduction in firearm suicide was found. One suicide prevented for every 10 gun removals under their law in Indiana. So the research shows what we already know qualitatively, that they are an effective tool, ERPOs are an effective tool at identifying extreme risk behavior in advance of harm and affording folks the opportunity to dispossess of that firearm. Research also affirms that the access to firearms alone can make any situation more lethal. Suicide is more likely to end in death with uh, victims of domestic violence dying five times more likely when there is a firearm presence, present. Um, we know that also 80% of the mass shootings that are conducted on school grounds by shooters under the age of 18 were used with a firearm that was sourced from their home. So access to firearms in the home is a critical piece of the puzzle. And with an ERPO, we have the opportunity to remove that access com component and reduce the possible lethality uh, in vulnerable situations. Next slide. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the plethora of tools already at your current disposal, uh, police, prosecutors alike, uh, that allow you to dispossess an individual of a firearm that pose a risk to themselves or others. Uh, there's a federal law that prohibits firearm purchase and possession for those convicted of a felony or domestic violence misdemeanor. Uh, there's a prohibition when you're subject to a domestic violence restraining order or designated an unlawful user or addicted to an, a controlled substance. If you've been adjudicated as mentally defective or committed to any mental institution or those that have renounced their U.S. citizenship as a fugitive uh, or a person who is unlawfully in the United States. Additionally, there are state laws that place additional prohibitions on enumerated groups. New York State, for instance, prohibits firearm access after a person has been convicted of specific felonies or other crimes defined as serious offenses by our state's laws, including child endangerment, certain disorderly conduct crimes, and certain stalking offenses. However, many who harm themselves or others with firearms are not prohibited people. And that's where ERPOs give you another tool in the toolbox. Uh, it's an important tool via court order where you're allowed to identify an individual and, as I mentioned, dispossess that person of a firearm before harm comes to them or their loved ones. Next slide. Uh, and also affirming what you know, it's a life-saving tool, a tool that's ultimately about limiting access, allowing law enforcement to remove firearms quickly during a crisis, which can be life or death, uh, and in part because law enforcement is uniquely situated to remove firearms because, as I just mentioned, 
law enforcement is already doing that and they do that well and they do that regularly. So by giving this additional tool to law enforcement, we leverage that expertise and that experience. ERPOs also permit courts to uh, issue a temporary emergency order immediately after a family member or a law enforcement officer or in New York State, a school administrator, mental health professional, provides sufficient uh, evidence that an individual poses an immediate risk of harming themselves or others. The research, the operational experience that I mentioned uh, that we've learned from agencies across the nation affirm all of that. So ERPOs are a tool for law enforcement, as well as some other uh, unique petitioners in New York State. It's a unique tool that allows you to limit access. It allows you to dispossess individuals before harm comes to them or others. And most importantly, and as we will discuss, it affords due process. After a term, a TERPO is issued, there is a period of time that is afforded to the respondent to prepare to respond in court. It's after that that the final order is issued with a duration that is known to all parties. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Next slide. So over the next 30 minutes or so, Sam and I will dive into the type of behavior, as I mentioned, ser filing for an ERPO, serving it, and extending it if necessary. And at the end, we'll have a couple questions uh, if there are any. Kicking it to you, Sam. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Sean. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rosado. Thank you to everyone at the DCJS team. As Michael Sean said, it's our, it's our great honor to be here presenting to you and a partner to you in this really important life-saving work. Uh, next slide, please. So as Michael Sean said, you know, the, the, the story of ERPOs is really a story of, of access prevention, right? It's risk assessment, threat assessment, and making sure that people who are in crisis and pose a threat to themselves or others don't have access to firearms. And so the, the front end of that work, the important part of the work that you all and, and, and your law enforcement partners across the state uh, are well situated to not just do yourselves, but also assist other petitioners in is identifying that high risk behavior, right? Understanding what, what can cause a moment of crisis, what can precede the kinds of mass shooting events that we see, self-harm, other kinds of gun violence tragedies, um, and how to use this, uh, use the red flag law and the ERPO process as a tool to, to disarm those individuals in crisis. Next slide, please. So who, uh, who can petition and what is the standard? As Michael Sean said, uh, the ERPO process is a freestanding civil court process. It's a tool that can be utilized separate and apart from any other uh, of the many you know, law enforcement interventions or other kind of interventions that you all do every day. Uh, it's a process that's available not only to you, but as Michael Sean said, to family and household members of people who are in crisis who might see those, who might recognize those dangerous warning signs, uh, also to school administrators uh, and their designees, uh, and to a certain class of enumerated um, mental health professionals who might notice uh, high risk behavior in the pe people that they're treating. Um, and so you all have a, a special role in this in light of the new change to the law, the most recent change to the law the commissioner mentioned, which is that you all actually have an affirmative duty to file these things. That isn't the case for those other classes of petitioners. Uh, and I also think you all have a very important role to play in supporting those other New Yorkers who might see at-risk behavior, who even, even some who might not be able to petition themselves, might who, who might be coming to you all in your agencies to seek help. When they recognize, for example, a coworker or a neighbor or somebody else that they have concerns about, you can be an asset to them um, in, in educating them on this process and then investigating yourselves and possibly um, seeking these life-saving orders. So um, as mentioned, you know, any time that there's probable cause to believe that an individual is likely to engage in conduct that would result in serious harm to himself, herself, or others, uh, and that terminology is borrowed from uh, the mental health law, a, a defined definition here in New York Code, um, you all have an affirmative duty to seek these orders. Um, and so that terminology is really meant to frame the kind of behavior that these um, laws are meant to address, right? And that is um, situations where there is a threat of harm to oneself uh, or to a harm to others. The usage of the terminology from men the mental health law should not be confused um, as somehow implicating that process, right? It's, it's, it's a definitional term that's brought over here to, to give meaning to the kinds of behavior that this order is meant to address. The ERPO process does not require a mental health evaluation. Uh, it does not uh, require a person to be suffering from any kind of mental illness uh, or, or, or of the sort that would require a commitment under you know, 939 or 941. Um, and that's a really important distinction to bear in mind. Uh, it really does sort of set the outer limits for uh, just defining the kind of danger that this, these orders are meant to address um, and to mitigate. So 
you know, it, it's really important for you all to understand that the factors that go into mental health commitments the things that are in the mental health law may, may be relevant here, right? There may be a person who's suffering from mental illness, but there are a whole host of factors and reasons um, that can give rise to a crisis, right? It could be substance abuse, it could be loss of a job, it could be bullying at school or online radicalization or extremism. Those things are not mental illnesses. And so this is a, this is a process, as I said, that's separate and, and apart from any of the any of the other sort of mental health interventions that you all um, as, as officers might be might be you know assisting people in, in getting plugged into. So I think the best practice is um, as I said, you know collaboration, communication, anytime you're investigating a case like this and, and, and recognizing or being informed about behavior of someone who might be uh, at risk of harming themselves or others, you want to make sure that you are, are doing your own thorough investigation and communicating broadly, right Un understanding that there are other stakeholders in this space, right Michael Sean mentioned, you know, the role the minors play in this, right? Minors are too young to buy firearms, but they might still have access, right? There could be guns in the home or elsewhere. If you have a case like that and you're, and you're aware of a minor who's in crisis, you should be communicating with schools, right? With with administrators and, and with state authorities, right? These are not all, the, the, the process works best when everyone's aware, when people are sharing information uh, and when you can all uh, work together to, to create a really comprehensive safety plan and move the process forward. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the statutory factors? As I said, the crux of the question is, you know, is this person uh, at risk of harming themselves or others? And the statute itself lays out a number of factors that the court is actually going to consider in every case. This list is not exhaustive. Uh, you don't have to present, you know, one through seven or tick three out of these seven boxes to, to support uh, a finding of, of risk or the issuance of an order. But this does give a good sense of what the court's gonna be looking for, right? The kind of behaviors that are indicative of a person being a danger to themselves or others and therefore not um, you know, not being uh, a good candidate for having access to firearms, a person whose access should be limited on a temporary basis. So as you see here, uh, those include, of course, threats or acts of violence or use of force, um, violation of orders of protection of any kind, uh, pending charges or convictions involving the use of a weapon, the reckless use or display or brandishing of a firearm, a history of, of violations of these extreme risk orders, uh, evidence of ongoing abuse of, of controlled substances or alcohol, uh, and evidence of recent acquisition. And recency when uh, when used and, and considered by the court means in the last six months prior to the date of filing. So again, these are the kind of things that the court will be considering. They won't be present in every case, but they are things for you to keep in mind as you do your own investigation to prepare um, that, that the court is going to be um, looking to. Next slide, please. Now, this is also vitally important. Um, what if you see high risk behavior, but there's no firearm? Um, firearm use is not required to obtain an ERPO. Firearm possession is not required to obtain an ERPO. Firearm access is not required to obtain an ERPO, right? There need not be a firearm currently in the mix. There need not be a threat with a firearm. The process itself is freestanding and it's meant to address not just current access, which is obviously vitally important, but also proactively to prevent future access, right? So as Michael Sean said, you have people who have no firearm prohibitions who are legal possessors, could go into a gun store in New York tomorrow and buy a rifle or shotgun, wouldn't need a permit, you know, could pass a background check. We're worried about those people too, right? And, and so you must, you, you have to think about this broadly, right? In a case where you have high risk behavior and a gun, that's of course something that has to be factored in and, and, and has to be disclosed to the court and is then going to be um, extremely important in determining how you proceed in terms of the process, right? Are you seeking, and we'll get into this later, but are you seeking not just an extreme risk protection order, but a search warrant, right? To remove those firearms immediately. It's gonna go into your tactical and strategic planning for removal, right? To be aware of, of where those firearms are and how many need to be you know, relinquished or removed. But those, you don't need those things for the order, right? If you have high risk behavior, that is enough. And again, the, the best practice for you all, we think is, Thorough investigation on the front end, again, collaboration and communication between your state, your partners, your agency, supervisors and the state and other stakeholders um, to understand the scope of current access, right? Are family members involved? Can you get more information about are there guns currently in the picture? But again, even if you can't, petitions can and should be filed um, if you believe a person poses a danger to themselves or others to prevent that future access. Um, and as I said, and you'll see from the later slides, any information you do get about access to firearms or where those guns might be is going to be crucially important in the petition process and then in your decision making for um, how you go forward. Next slide, please. So what does high risk behavior look like in the field? You all know better than I do, right? This is the work you do every day. You, you are out there talking to community members, call, you know, answering calls for help, calls for assistance. You deal with threats of violence. You deal with people who are who are um, considering or threatening harm to self. Um, you deal with people who are impaired, people who are addicted to drugs. You 
deal with, you know, welfare checks and people who are behaving erratically, some people who are, you know, in acute mental health crisis or dealing with other behavioral health issues. Any number of these things can lead to a crisis, any number of them can precipitate a crisis, and any number of them can be, um, that harm can be mitigated by, you know, pursuing one of these orders to make sure the person in crisis doesn't have access to firearms. Um, but it's really important to note here, as Michael Shum did at the outset, this is distinct from arrest, it's distinct from prosecution, it's distinct from mental health commitments and evaluations. This is a freestanding process, uh, and it's only part of the solution, right? The solution to the crisis ultimately is not just ensuring a person can access firearms, that's obviously crucially important, but so too is addressing the root causes of the crisis, right? Getting those people some supports they need, getting them treatment, getting them whatever it might be, right? Ensuring that they and their families have what they need to, to actually address the root causes. And so different types of dangers and different types of high-risk behavior will require necessarily a different set of law enforcement responses, right? And some non-law enforcement responses too from stakeholder partners and advocates and others that you all are familiar with working with all the time. Um, and as I said, you also can be a really vital hub even for cases that you don't initiate um, to help, you know, support family member petitioners, medical health practitioners, school, you know, school officials who are in this process who need your assistance, not just with the, the, the strategy and the removal, but also with helping to connect them with the other state agencies that can actually do really vital work um, in making sure that we address not just the immediate risk of gun access, but the, 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 the broader crisis to make sure that the, the risk is abated on a long-term basis. Um, and then next slide, please. So one you know, important intersection here, and as I said, there's, there's, these kind of intersectionalities are gonna exist throughout this work, right? You're gonna find crises that emanate from mental health, you're gonna find crises that emanate from substance abuse, and what if there is crisis in a domestic violence situation, right? Which you all deal with far too often every day. Um, you should consider in those cases, like how is, where does a red flag order sit, right? How can an ERPO be a part of this response, right? Is there going to be an arrest or a prosecution? Is there gonna be a domestic violence order of protection? How's the case going to unfold? And the ERPO can be a part of that story, right? One, the ERPO is not meant to be used to the exclusion of anything else and vice versa, right? It doesn't, it doesn't foreclose any other process and it is not foreclosed by any other process. Um, so as you really respond to these calls and assess the risk and try to think again about the long-term safety plan for victims, for their families, this should be one thing that you consider. Uh, safety is the goal, right? That is always your goal. That's job one. You all do it every day and, and, and we're grateful for it. Achieving that goal requires a comprehensive plan, right? It requires not just the access prevention piece, that's what, get, what the ERPO can get you in very short order, um, but also a whole host of other interventions and supports. And again, um, you know, we urge you and, 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 and I think, you know, our, our, the, the team at DCJS agrees the importance of really consulting with advocates uh, and, and doing a, a broad-based safety plan in all these cases is vitally important. Uh, next slide, please. For some context, again, it's also worth remembering what ERPOs do versus what a DV restraining order does, right? There's a lot of overlap, not just in terms of what the process looks like, right? You have temporary ex parte orders and final, you have similar due process protections. Um, the processes are meant, you know, in fact, to, to look a bit alike. They're, they're similar civil court processes, um, at least on the civil side of the street for, for DV. Um, and they require that same kind of coordination and communication and safety planning, but DV orders obviously cover a whole other range of things that red flag orders do not, right? An ERPO is strictly about, you know, purchase and possession and of firearms. DV restraining orders have a host of other protections, which of course under New York state law include that firearm prohibition, right? Um, but so too, it, you know, you have stay away and no contact provisions. You have another just a broader set of protections, you know, directed at, of course, the victim and their family. Um, they can only be requested in the civil sense, of course, by the victims themselves, not by you all as petitioners. So it's important to understand the differences in the overlap, the distinctions um, obviously are, are crucial and you should think about both, you know, in the cases where both, both issues are implicated. Uh, next slide, please. So now on the, onto the process itself, again, we want to get, we're not going to get all the way deep into the weeds here. As you said, our time is short, um, as Johanna mentioned. So we want to get you an overview of sort of what the process looks like, the decision points you're going to have, the ways to best prepare. Um, and then we'll try to, again, we'll, there'll, there'll hopefully be more time for us to dig deeper into, into some other issues down the road, but um, let's walk through the process. Uh, please, next slide. So what are the types of orders at play here? As I said, you've got basically two types of extreme risk protection orders. You have ex parte temporary orders, we can call those TERPOs, temporary ERPOs, and final orders, uh, which we refer to as ERPOs here. Um, and again, final is something of a misnomer, right? All of these orders by their nature are temporary. There is no, there is no ERPO that lasts forever. Um, temporary, a final order can, can last up to 12 months, um, but at that point, it would have to be renewed if the crisis and the, and the risk factors remain. And Michael Sean will talk a bit more about that at the end. Um, 
TERPOs, the temporary orders can be issued immediately upon the filing of a petition if you request it. Um, however, in theory, you could file a petition and simply request a hearing, right? And the court will set the case down for a hearing and decide at the hearing if there's going to be a final order issued. The benefit, of course, we'll, we'll get into the, the benefits of the TERPO in a moment, but it is up to the petitioner to decide in that first instance whether they are simply filing the petition or filing the petition and requesting uh, a TERPO, a temporary order. Next slide, please. So the benefits of the TERPO, um, uh, clearly, as Michael Sean mentioned, are the immediacy, right? These are these are appropriate when you're talking about a, an imminent threat, um, when you need the immediate benefit of the prohibition, when you need to initiate the process of uh, surrender or removal. Um, and again, this is an ex parte process. As with domestic violence orders, you can do a temporary order before there's been a full hearing, before all the parties have appeared uh, and made their case. This can be done without notice to the respondent, and it creates uh, you know, that initial window where you're going to have the order in effect upon service uh, and where you can initiate the process before the full hearing um, is held and, and, and the application is ultimately decided. Um, you know, it, is the, it is the right response when there is an imminent threat, when there's an emergency. Um, it is, uh, as I said, it's effective upon service. It's going to require immediate surrender and, of course, gives you all, as we'll talk about, you know, the opportunity uh, to, to do that immediate work of, of, of removal and surrender and relinquishment. Um, and it's going to be heard immediately on the same day you actually file or the next business day if it's, you know, if the hour is late. Um, and if there is a turbo issued, a temporary order, that's going to remain in effect for just three to six business days. It's essentially a placeholder for um, until the court can schedule a full hearing, at which point the final order will be, uh, the application will be considered and a final order would be uh, granted or denied. Uh, next slide, please. So um, for completing the petition, and again, you're going to need a petition whether or not you decide to seek um, that TERPO, the temporary order, um, all these petitions, whether filed by you all or a family or, or household member or a, another petitioner, must be sworn under oath. They have to allege the specific facts and circumstances that you believe justify the issuance of the order, right? The things that demonstrate the person is a risk of harming themselves or others. Um, and they must include, if known to you, any information that you have about actual access to a firearm, rifle, or shotgun at the time of the petition. Um, and again, if you have that information, there's actually you know, space to fill out in detail the firearms, the types, where they're located. Um, and as I said, the um, petition may or may not request at that time whether you're asking for ex parte relief or a temporary order, a TERPO, um, and may be supported by any uh, additional documentation that you think supports the application or helps to you know, tell the story of, of why this person is at risk. Um, it is worth noting here, this is a civil process. Um, so if it's being initiated independent of any outstanding criminal charges, um, this isn't a case where you can go into justice and run raps, right? But criminal history might be relevant to the court's inquiry, but you can't initiate a search based solely on this civil process. Of course, that information and other relevant information might be available from other sources, right? These individuals might be known to you or your department or your agency. They might be known to statewide agencies, and we'll talk more about that later of where that information can, um, can appropriately be found. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, the best practices for you all as petitioners and things that you want to have at hand, the things you want to look into before you prepare the petition and file, obviously, you know, documentary evidence that that, that indicate high risk behavior, police reports, CADs, um, DIR, as we talk about below, right, things that are indicative and that detail the kind of behaviors that you're that you or others have recognized. Um, evidence of prior calls for service, right, if you're if, if you're a law enforcement officer and you've been going back again, recency matters, you're, the court's going to consider the last six months, but if you have more than that, and there's a longer history, you should be presenting everything that's relevant. Um, you know, any evidence of, of current gun ownership, licensure, right? People who have carry permits or possession permits for, for um, handguns and, and pistols and rollers, um, evidence of recent purchases, as we talked about, your own personal observations, again, contacts with, with, with family or others, right? There's a really important role for you all to play in not just ensuring, you know, the, pr protecting the broader public safety, but supporting the families of people who are in crisis, right? Because they may they, they can seek it themselves or they might be seeking out your help right, for the process um, and then helping to ensure that they have the support they need. Um, and again, any other evidence that uh, you think helps to, to demonstrate to the court and illustrate the harm, you know, DMV records, uh, again, contacts with, with crime analysis centers and other statewide um, um, registries, all really helpful and all really useful ways to gather information that's going to be germane to this question. It's going to help the court, um, you know, make, make the right decision on the petition. Next slide, please. Uh, again, before filing, and, and, and this is, you know, something that I know all of your departments going to be working on, DCJS, as you heard, is going to be working on some model policies as well, and, and we're, we're happy to partner with you all in that work. Um, it's really important to have best practices here to, to think about all the, all the boxes you want to check and the pre-work you want to do before, you know, the petition is filed. So that may include 
um, you know, seeking legal advice or communication with your own city or county attorney, communications with, you know, prosecutor's offices who are obviously represented here today and could be doing this petitioning themselves, who might have concurrent investigations going or, or other in, or other relevant knowledge about a, a subject or a potential subject. Um, uh, notify folks who have provided information to you, again, family members, others who might actually be the adverse themselves or otherwise have information that's that's germane to the process. Um, and also, again, communicating broadly with not just your law enforcement partners at the local and state level, but again, school officials, uh, you know, OMH, you know, other agencies that might need to know, right? People who might have contacts with individuals, people who should be aware of this. Um, again, communication is, is key. Um, and safety is the goal and getting there, I think, um, the, the, really, the, the, the more the better. Next slide, please. So the next steps, once you actually file the petition, um, you uh, the court's going to evaluate the petition. They're going to evaluate your request for a TERPO if you've made one. Um, and then if a TERPO is issued, um, that's going to be served along with the copy of the petition of itself to the, to the respondent, to the person who's made subject to the TERPO. Even if there's no request for a TERPO, there's going to be service of the petition itself so they can prepare for the hearing and understand that the process has been initiated. They're going to get copies of the supporting documents that you provide and all the details of you know, where, to, where they have to be for the final hearing um, if they choose to appear. And then, of course, the final hearing will be scheduled. So, as I said, if there, if there is a TERPO granted, it's only going to be three to six business days, that's the window. You have to have a final hearing after that time. If there is no TERPO, it's gonna be no later than 10 business days when that final hearing is gonna be held. Uh, next slide, please. So enforcement uh, and monitoring. So, you know, the order itself, as I said, functions to prohibit a person from you know, purchasing and possessing or attempting to purchase or possess a firearm of any kind. Um, and it's gonna be effective at the time of service. And you know, making sure that order is enforced is obviously the crucial part, right? If you have a person who currently has access to firearms, you want to dispossess, you want to make sure those firearms are surrendered or otherwise removed. Um, and there's a couple of ways to go about that. The, the process itself um, obligates you all, uh, the officers who actually serve the notice of, of the hearing and or the, the, the TERPO or, or final ERPO as, as it may be, to actually request affirmatively surrender from this now prohibited person, right? So you actually are obliged by law to, to request surrender at that time. Um, but the order itself does not function as a search warrant, right? It is a it is strictly a, an order that changes their legal status with respect to firearm ownership. It doesn't authorize a search. What you are authorized to do, what you're obligated to do, is to ask for surrender and, as as is always the case, remove any firearms that that are either in plain view, uh, are you know you are, you are given consent to search for, or are removed as a result of any other lawful search, again, short of a search warrant. An ERPO is not a search warrant, doesn't authorize you to go in and search a, a residence or any other location. However, if you know that you're you're filing a petition in a case where there are guns currently in the picture, right, if there are guns in their possession to which they have access, you can and should be seeking a search warrant in, in at the same time that you seek the ERPO, right? And all the same rules apply, and that's contemplated in the statute. All the same standards uh, under CPL 690 or probable cause finding that there are guns, you know, that there are firearms and you know where they can be found should be presented to the court and in those cases you should be walking out essentially with two pieces of paper right you have the the turpo and the and the petition for service and you have your search warrant so that at the time of service you can advise the person that you're you know you have both these things and you can go and actually affirmatively remove in the cases where you don't have that that information that's fine um you can and should you're going to you know continue to, to to serve as you would you're going to ask for relinquishment as you would in any case um and then there's a separate work of ensuring, again, through investigation, through communications with family or others, if there, if you learn of firearms that a person has failed to surrender, and we'll talk about that more a little later, you can then subsequently seek a search warrant, again, under all the same rules under CPL 690. Um, the court decision is also going to be transmitted, of course, to all the relevant stakeholders at the state and federal level, right? So state police is going to be notified, DCJS. Um, that information has to be transmitted to the FBI at the NICS, so it, it can be included in a NICS database, of course, it's a prohibiting record, right? So a person who is subject to an ERPO cannot legally purchase a firearm anywhere, New York or elsewhere, so we want to make sure those records are being reported out. Um, so again, so access is prevented on a going forward basis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and you'll see, and there's some links at the end of the slide, you know, these forms, um, if you're not familiar with them already, are available on the state court website. Next slide, you'll be doing the application for the order and, and a temporary, and then a request for court intervention. Uh, if you do the next slide, please, Molly. Uh, and those are available um, online. Uh, let's see, and I'm sure we'll be included in, in all the guidance materials from DCJS. So now I'm gonna uh, send it back to Michael Sean to talk a bit more about the service process. 
Thank you, Sam. Um, and just to reiterate uh, what I shared in the beginning, this is really nothing new. Um, it's a new tool uh, that gives you a, an additional power, but it's very similar to the other opportunities you have to dispossess individuals. Next slide, please. Um, the petition process that Sam just shared is unique uh, to red flag laws, but service, le much less so. Um, it's very similar to many of the other tools that you guys are utilizing. Next slide, please. So what we're gonna do quickly is go over uh, the component of the law that governs service, uh, just pulling out some of the, the critical insights, and then I'm gonna share a couple more best practices. I'd also like to note, when we keep mentioning these best practices, um, these are best practices that have been shared with us specifically by the San Diego Police Department, which is conducting training across California with the support of the state on their GVRO law, which is their version of the ERPA law, separately with the Pinellas County Sheriff in Florida, who at the outset of Florida's implementation decided to take over all uh, applications for the entire county to ensure continuity of service, as well as best practices being adopted and separately uh, with the Kings County uh, Firearm Relinquishment Unit out of the city attorney and district attorney's uh, offices. They work collaboratively to ensure similarly continuity of service and best practices being adopted. So we've worked closely with them over the last few years and they've informed many of the best practices that you hear Sam and I sharing with you. So jumping back in real quickly, um, the effect of an ERPO, um, it's really clear, but upon service, as was just shared, um, an officer must immediately request a surrender of those firearms and take into possession all firearms that are in plain sight. That's when they don't have the search warrant. And Sam will jump back in to talk about when you might want to consider a search warrant and other considerations as well. Um, additionally, the respondent will be officially prohibited of purchasing, possessing, and receiving firearms upon effectuation of service. Um, any existing fire firearm licenses are to be suspended and they will be ineligible for another license during the duration of that red flag law and the order from the court. Next slide. When we talk about service, it's important to note, right, that regardless of whether a TERPO is issued, the court will provide copies of the ERPO documents to the law enforcement agency. Before you leave the court, you're going to want to make sure in your packet you have the notice of hearing, the petition and any supporting documents, any temporary order, as well as the form for the respondent to complete, which describes the firearms possessed by the respondent. A couple slides ago, we showed you those two forms uh, that you can access online uh, via the Corps website. It will guide you through providing that exact information, which you'll source from all of those resources that Sam shared, your CAD system, the Crime Analysis Network, a DIR repository, having conversations with school administrators, mental health professionals who may have been, uh, interacted with this individual. You'll be able to capture all of that on that form that you will serve on the court so that the judge uh, can consider that information when deciding whether to petition. But it should also be in the packet that you receive back from the court. You have to pr uh, promptly serve uh, these documents. And of note, when you have a respondent that's under the age of 14, to properly effectuate service, not only must it be on that individual, but on their guardian or parent to properly effectuate service. So keep that in mind. Next slide. Uh, service must be immediate, as was shared. Um, best practices from a number of the folks we've spoken to uh, define that as within 24 hours. As was mentioned, must remove all firearms in plain sight. Um, you must issue a receipt identifying all of the firearms that have been recovered, just as you would with any other search warrant. Um, uh, and you must retain and store these firearms for up to two years while the order is in effect. Obviously, if it's terminated prior, uh, that it, the respondent has the right uh, in some cases uh, when they can prove lawful possession, uh, that they may actually retain their firearms. And we've uh, heard a number of agencies around the state, or uh, nation rather, who have crafted solutions to provide transparency to respondents. So they know how their personal property will be managed and possibly returned in the future to provide more access uh, and comfort with the process. Uh, skip the next slide. Um, and let's go to, yes, exactly, perfect. Um, so here are some of those best practices. And as I mentioned, we've been having conversations across the nation with folks, as well as through the pandemic staying in touch to see how uh, access to courts may have impacted uh, the usage of these tools. Fortunately, courts are back online. And as we discussed, and as the commissioner mentioned, we're seeing a great uptick across the state. Um, 
But in part, we want to make sure that people are utilizing the same strategies uh, from county to county to provide continuity, right? Uh, personally serving on each respondent is required, but also developing your service protocols, uh, including use of force, enforcement, uh, and high-risk service guidance for officers, recognizing that these can be uh, incredibly dangerous uh, interactions as well, similar to a domestic violence uh, uh, interaction. Conduct your threat assessment as you always would. Uh, designate an officer to coordinate service of all ERPOs to ensure consistency, regardless of the tour um, that an ERPO is being requested on. Develop a standard information package uh, that can maximize respondent comprehension. As I mentioned, there are some agencies that are providing information on how their firearm will be stored after it's been uh, recovered. Other folks are giving information about accessing additional support services, uh, social services that can help address some of the root causes that might be exacerbating that person's vulnerability for harming themselves or others. Uh, and then also ensure that ERPOs show up in all the systems available to officers. Officers need that information in real time so that they can provide the, the service they desire to help people when they're in need. They need to know if an ERPO has been issued, if this is someone that has been determined by the court to not be safe to possess a firearm, they should know that before any interaction, whether related to an ERPO or not. And then lastly, here are a couple more. Document every service attempt. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit at the end about working to get an extension of that order. This is the sort of information that might support that petition if you've deemed that necessary. Document any concerning behavior when you are effectuating service and recovering those firearms that you might observe. Document any statements um, as you would normally when, any, when you make any in, uh, interaction um, that might support your future petition or perhaps other investigations that might be uh, occurring contemporaneously. And you must mail proof of service to the clerk of the court uh, by the end of the next business day after service is complete. Of course, many of your agencies have very close relationships with your court clerks. You might fashion a more immediate way to get that information to them, but you must mail proof as well um, as a record of, of providing it to the court. Uh, personal service should be effectuated within 24 hours. Uh, if the first attempt is not successful, you should make a minimum of two additional attempts. If the respondent is high risk, additional attempts should be made to ensure that that person does not harm themselves or others. Uh, and if it seems that the respondent is evading, law enforcement should research other possible service locations and accompany the respondent to the location where the weapons may be stored. Uh, we've had a number of agencies, particularly San Diego, who have mentioned folks want to respond. They want to uh, give up their firearms, but they don't want to do it uh, in their home or they don't want to do it uh, at, their, or at their job. They'll meet them in a, a neutral location. They'll receive service. They'll then go get the firearms and in some instances provide them to uh, law enforcement in a safe manner away from the home. Obviously, we have to have the necessary assurances that we've recovered all firearms, uh, and that's where a search warrant might also be helpful. But here are some best practices that are already being adopted across the nation by officers who are similarly utilizing ERPO every single day to save lives. I'm going to kick it back to Sam now to talk a little bit about the value of search warrants and what you might want to consider uh, when you're thinking about getting uh, a search warrant in addition to a TERPO or ERPO. Uh, thanks, Michael, Sean. Um, next slide, please, Molly. Uh, one more, I think. Next slide, please. I think. Yes, there we are. So, you know, I mentioned this a bit before, but I, it's, it's, it's worth repeating and I want to be precise. You know, um, all the rules around search and seizure, all the rules for, for when you can obtain a search warrant, when you can search a location without a search warrant, exigency, uh, or any other exception to the warrant requirement all remain in place. The ERPO does not change any of that. The issuance of an order doesn't substitute a search warrant. It doesn't authorize any kind of search that's not otherwise authorized by law, right? So again, guns that are in plain view, guns that are recovered pursuant to a consent search, that sort of thing. All those rules apply. And if you see those at the time of service, if they're in plain sight and they're they're in the location where you you know there's a prohibited person, you should be removing those. The law authorizes it. And, and as, as you all do every, every day, you know the rules on this. Um, nothing in the order itself doubles as a search warrant. If you want, if you believe there are guns present, if there are guns currently in the access of a person who's in crisis, you should be detailing that information for the court and seeking a search warrant concurrently when you file the, the ERPO petition. So you, again, this is all pre-planning. This is work you guys do all the time. You understand well, 
Um, but all the same rules apply. So if you are going, you're not just going to have, if, if that's your plan, right? If you, if you know there are guns in the mix, we want those removed immediately. Um, you should be preparing not just to, to complete the ERPO petition and lay out all the factors for the court as to why the order is necessary, but also to meet your obligations under 690, right? Of the probable cause to know that there are guns present and where they can be found so that you can remove them. Um, and as I said, you can also be searching doing a search warrant after the fact, right? In a case where you don't have that information in hand about current access or immediate access when you make the petition, you continue the work, as Michael said, as Michael Sean said, there's it's actually incumbent on the, the respondent to to affirm to the court whether they have guns in their possession, then there should be work being done on the back end by you all and your colleagues to actually follow up and ensure that people are surrendering in accordance with the order, right? Because if they're not, then th there, there's additional work that should be done to, to dispossess those individuals and make sure that, that these firearms are removed from dangerous situations. And as I said, in either case, you're gonna have to meet those same probable cause requirements to obtain a search warrant, separate and apart from the burdens you're going to have to meet at the various stages of the uh, herbal process to obtain either a temporary or a final order. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, third party property, this may become relevant you know, at the time of service. If you're in a, a home or a residence that's shared by multiple people, if you do see a firearm that's in plain sight, um, you may get a request at a later date for someone saying, no, that's not that's not the herbal subject's firearm, that's my firearm and I'm not prohibited. Can I please have it back? Um, a number of steps you have to take then, right? First, you're going to have to verify ownership, um, verify that the person who's claiming the firearm is not actually prohibited themselves. And most importantly, you have to confirm that if they are, when you return that firearm, if it is going back to a location where the respondent could gain access to it, um, that it's stored in a way that they actually cannot, right? Uh, the New York Secure Storage Law, as amended, explicitly requires anyone who resides with a person who is subject to an ERPO to ensure they don't have access, right? It's a crime not to do that, uh, and they need to be understood made aware of that obligation. So if firearms are returned to that third party, they do not then uh, again become accessible to the person who's subject to the extreme risk order. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and as Michael Sean said, you know, when you, uh, after that initial petition is filed in the Turpo, you're going to be have that final hearing. That's the respondent's opportunity to appear um, and participate, present evidence as to why they are not in fact a threat to themselves or others, or why the evidence doesn't meet the, the standard um, required by law to issue the order. Um, anyone who's, um, you know, obviously the, the petition itself is signed and sworn, anyone who, you know, presents evidence or, or, or swears falsely in that context as a witness or otherwise um, could be charged um, with, with perjury or violation of state law. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are, there may be instances where the hearing itself gets adjourned uh, or, or, the, or the respondent uh, requests a continuance for time to, you know, to gather evidence or prepare their case. Um, and again, if it is continued, uh, you want to make sure that the temporary order, if there is one in place, is, is extended. So that protection extends and the prohibition extends until the hearing is held. Um, and you want to make sure that copies of all the um, uh, additional records and, and minutes and all the evidence um, are, are, are recorded and kept. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the final step in the process is, of course, the, the final order. So once the hearing is held, all the evidence has been presented, um, the court is going to you know, render its decision if it finds that the that the ERPO is is um, is necessary, is justified, and the, the evidence is sufficient. It's going to issue that order for a period of up to twelve months, uh, and then you're again, if the defendant is present, they'll be served in court. Of course, uh, if they are not present, if they absent themselves or or simply aren't there, um, again, the same sort of service of process will um, will follow. You know, again, re requesting surrender of firearms that weren't removed at the time, uh, if there was a temporary order. Uh, all those same steps and again all the same notifications to the statewide stakeholders state police dcjs uh, and the national stakeholders you know fbi for inclusion in all the relevant databases to make sure that the prohibiting record um, is available and then i'll kick it back to michael sean to finish us up on termination and extension i think you're muted michael sean all right, next slide. Perfect. So after issuance of a final ERPO, it must still be served. Uh, if the respondent isn't present, firearms may still need to be removed if there wasn't a TERPO. So I'd encourage uh, everyone to review the slides, particularly uh, Sam's earlier slides when, when you receive them. Uh, next slide. Now, much of this is already known. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's been a, a, a huge uptick, but only a judge may actually terminate an ERPO prior to its expiration. Uh, the respondent must submit one written request to get a hearing to vacate if that's their desire. And upon receipt of that request, 
the court must schedule a hearing promptly, uh, providing reasonable notice as well to the petitioner, whether that's law enforcement or family member, school administrator, so that they similarly can participate. Uh, the standard of proof uh, is on really the, the respondent to show clear and convincing evidence that there's been a change in circumstances, either in their behavior, uh, the indicia of which could be access to services or other uh, evidence they may present to the court. Um, and they may submit a proof of change of cir circumstances due to successful medical treatment. Um, but of course, next slide, uh, there's an opportunity to respond. Um, if the court is terminated, if, if the order is terminated after that opportunity to respond by the petitioner, uh, the court must notify DCJS. Uh, and there also must be an order to return the firearms. And that's why I mentioned earlier that some agencies have fashioned solutions to ensure the safe secure and return of firearms when such does occur. Uh, next slide 40. Uh, this is the form that must be filled out. Uh, the application to return firearms, as I mentioned, it's on the respondent to complete this form and issue it to the court, after which the court will notify the petitioner, the law enforcement agency, uh, or others. Next slide. It also may only be renewed by a judge. Uh, and of course, not by the same judge who issued it, but by a judge sitting in the same court. Um, and as mentioned, there is an opportunity to respond. Uh, law enforcement officers may by motion request an extension of the ERPO as well uh, at any time within 60 days of expiration. So to be clear, um, if a respondent would like to terminate their order or uh, they have to issue uh, one of those, the document that I just showed you on the court. Separately, if law enforcement wants to extend the order, they must show up in that court 60 days prior to uh, the, the expiration of that ERPO. And upon request of law enforcement's uh, petition to extend, they must similarly notify all necessary parties so that the respondent can be able uh, to, to participate. Uh, additionally, even if the initial petitioner was a family member or school administrator or one of those other unique petitioner classes, law enforcement is still empowered to petition a court for an extension. Um, and the standard of proof is on the petitioner must show by clearing convincing evidence that the respondent continues uh, to show behavior and conduct that might result in serious harm to themselves or others. So it's important to recognize that this is a, a tool that's very similar to those that are already in your toolbox, but that affords you the opportunity to reduce access and dispossess an individual who may not already be prohibited or an individual who might be prohibited who is in crisis. Additionally, the process affords due process following the issuance of a TERPO if you do request one and a person is afforded three to six days to respond and come into court. And then even after a final ERPO is issued, uh, there's an opportunity to have it vacated if there's a change in their circumstance. Furthermore, if that behavior is further escalating during the duration of that ERPO or TERPO, law enforcement and petitioners have the opportunity to position uh, to petition for an extension or renewal of that order, ultimately with the goal of reducing access to those who pose an immediate risk to themselves or others, removing access to firearms, reducing the likelihood of fatality. So uh, I know we went through a lot real quickly. I know there were some questions. Uh, I'm, I'm going to kick it back to the DCJS team uh, to guide us through those uh, if we'd like to answer any. But these slides, of course, will be available to the DCJS team. And as was mentioned, you're going to have a model policy forthcoming. Next slide. Uh, we noted a couple forms. Please go to NewYorkStateCourts.gov and access them, familiarize yourself with them. Um, there's another form that we scanned through really quickly, a judicial intervention form, in addition to your actual petition that lays out the designated individual, the designated location, the information about make and model of firearms, if that is uh, information you're privy to, um, there's also an additional form that must be filled out. And I know some of you may already be familiar with it having gone through this process, but the judicial intervention form is how you actually get a civil court judge assigned to the case. And that's how you get the process moving so that they can then issue all the necessary notices to the respondent so that they can then participate in three to six days. So it's important to not only file your petition, but the judicial intervention document. Um, additionally, there's gonna be times when you're gonna wanna apply for an ERPO immediately and their courts might be closed. This is the 800 number that the courts uh, have made available to petitioners across the state. Please utilize it. There's the email as well. 
Next slide. Feel free to reach out to Sam and I if you have any questions. On every town, you'll find much of the research that we have uh, referenced towards the top. Um, as well as continuing analysis as we work to continue to support states, the 19 plus DC across the nation that are working hard uh, to implement this law. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, Sean, and Sam. I mean, very critical information um, to uh, for all of our law enforcement partners, and we really appreciate your partnership and your leadership on this initiative.